Thanks, Susan. Um, and last but not least, we have Andy Carvin, who most of you know from his work running online communities at NPR, and now is at First Look Media. And uh, in his brief transition between the two, has been working on um, some work on breaking news reporting for us. Thanks. Um, let me just see if I can find where that folder is right now. All right, so uh, the name of my project is Broken News, and uh, I'm specifically interested in trying to better understand what happens during a breaking news cycle when traditional legacy news organizations gets a story very, very wrong, and how that's impacted by social media. Um, I'm intimately familiar with this process, and uh, the reason I am is because uh, of a rather embarrassing situation that NPR put itself in uh, a few years ago during our reporting on the Gabby Gifford shooting. Um, NPR was one of the very first news organizations to break the story because we actually had a public radio staffer nearby um, uh, the incident when it happened. But unfortunately, not long after we began reporting it, we started telling people that she had died. Now, this was obviously a huge reporting failure on NPR's part. Uh, to make a long story short, uh, there were a number of protocols that weren't uh, followed in terms of how many uh, independent sources you have. Uh, it wasn't run by a senior editor before going out on air. But what ended up happening is once uh, Pandora's box had opened uh, on air through uh, the top of the hour newscast. It cascaded through digital, uh, first being posted on our homepage, and then a news alert going out, and then finally this tweet going out uh, a few minutes after we reported it. Now, you would think that uh, there would be a lot of impact from NPR using its broadcast air to say a breaking news story that she had died. But as it turns out, a lot of the news organizations such as Reuters and others who cited NPR in the claim that she had died uh, got it from our Twitter feed. Uh, it's become such habit for news organizations to pay attention to what each of us are posting that it's almost reflexive now. And so uh, even other organizations that they were in the middle of their own sourcing, they ended up relying on us uh, inaccurately. Now, thankfully, we got a lot of feedback online very, very quickly uh, from uh, other sources and other news organizations that uh, were reporting that she was actually in surgery. So we were able to put out uh, uh, a, um, an update through Twitter and through other sources, uh, other platforms, uh, telling people that this, we might have not gotten this right. There are conflicting reports now, and we're going to try to figure it out. And what ended up happening is, as just as fast as the story spread like wildfire through Twitter, we were able to start the correction process much faster through Twitter. It actually took much longer before anything was said on air that finally said that we got the story wrong. But through social media, because of the inherent uh, call and response nature of it, uh, there was a much uh, faster way of us dealing with it. And so, based on that very humbling experience at NPR, I thought it would be interesting to take a look at several case studies in situations where news organizations got something very wrong, and then social media somehow impacted the dynamic. Um, I just mentioned the first one, which is Gabby Giffords. Uh, I'm also looking at the Newtown Massacre, uh, and then finally looking at the Boston bombing uh, from last year. So um, I talked a bit about Gabby Giffords already, so let's jump over to Newtown. So uh, the first couple hours uh, after, uh, after the attack had happened were complete chaos. There were all sorts of reports coming out from news organizations claiming things such as a second shooter, uh, that uh, the shooter had gone back to someone's house and killed themselves there, uh, that there was a purple or maroon van that was somehow involved in being targeted by a SWAT team. Uh, people were just relying on all sorts of information uh, that ultimately proved to be incorrect. Uh, but one of the most famous uh, or infamous examples uh, that day was when CNN was the first news organization uh, to suggest that a young man named Ryan Lanza was behind the attack. Uh, 
Um, and they weren't the only ones doing this. The Associated Press also reported this through their law enforcement uh, uh, sources that uh, the, the young man's name was uh, Ryan Lanza. Now, within an hour or so, we began to find out differently because uh, he was able to get on his Facebook page and he posted an update very angrily, as you can see, uh, <laughs> saying that it wasn't him. And, you know, on the, one hand, on the one hand, obviously this is funny, but at the same time it's horribly tragic because not only is he just realizing that someone, that his brother was likely involved, he's also probably just receiving the news that his mother had been killed. And so this young man, when he should be focusing on grieving and helping the rest of his family, he ended up getting sucked into this, this cycle of BS that got things wrong because law enforcement sources accidentally said the wrong name and let that cascade for the media. And so in this particular case, uh, as in the, with the Gabby Giffords case, what I've been doing is grabbing raw Twitter data uh, using a tool called Topsy Pro. Uh, they've actually shut it down recently or shut, up, shut down access to a lot of people, so thankfully I was able to get the data before they did that. But what, I've been, what I ended up doing was grabbing all the raw data on Twitter, mentioning his name uh, the name Ryan Lanza and different parameters. So these are literally in that very first minute of reporting at uh, 11, 11 a.m. Pacific time, uh, Ryan Lanza, a quote unquote, uh, people started talking about it. And if you go down a little bit, you start seeing that the source they're all using is CNN. Um, and in fact, if you look at the same data, sorting it by uh, the uh, size of the Twitter accounts, you can get a better sense of how many news organizations and other outlets that had huge, huge Twitter followings got the story wrong. And so uh, what I'm now trying to do is to really piece together a TikTok of how these tweets circulated, what they were reporting on air at the time, and what tweets were coming back, if any, pushing back uh, at their coverage. Now, in the case of the Boston bombing, um, I decided to take a very different route and, and flip the, the research on its head. And rather looking at how the media made a major mistake, I'm looking specifically at how online communities made a horrific mistake, which eventually ended up cascading in the media. So it's going in the opposite direction. Um, and the, the most notorious example from that particular week was when uh, the online communities 4chan and Reddit tried using photos from the scene of the bombing to identify who the bombers were. And as you can see here, uh, there were certain techniques they used that probably wouldn't be the very first things we would do. For example, we wouldn't necessarily start by identifying all the brown people in the photos. And they were doing this publicly in their online communities, really trying to use racial profiling as a way to narrow down the suspect list. Eventually, another Reddit thread brought up the possibility that one of the killers was a young man who had recently gone missing uh, at Brown University uh, named Sonny Shripathi. And they began circulating this photo, which is a combination. Uh, the first two uh, on the top left and the center left are pictures of, of Sonny Shripathi. But the others are photos of, uh, from the FBI, of, uh, uh, who ended up turning out to be Jahar Tsarnaev. So this photo was circulated widely across the internet. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, it ended up uh, ending uh, tragically, uh, not only in the sense that they put the blame on this young man for a certain part of that week, uh, it later turned out that Sunny Tripathi had killed himself. Uh, he had gone missing several weeks before that, and it was only after the Boston bombing a couple of weeks later that his body was discovered. And so yet again, we have a situation where a cascade of misinformation not only misinformed the public, but did a tremendous disservice to the family and friends of the particular person who was targeted in it. And so I guess in sum, what I'm really trying to do is understand the interplay between social media and news organizations when something is uh, reported during a breaking news cycle and uh, it turns out to be incorrect. Clearly there are plenty of examples that can be found beyond these three that can point fingers in all directions. And I think that's part of the problem is that 
we end up, too many of us in uh, news organizations, I think we like to revel in the mistakes that, that when Reddit makes a mistake or another online community screws it up. Uh, it, uh, that sense of superiority we have that we, we're doing a better job at it than they are, though clearly there are plenty of cases where that's not the case. Uh, so uh, my project's going to look uh, uh, deeply into this. It's going to explore some potential solutions in terms of how uh, journalists uh, can embed themselves better in these communities and be active, more actively involved when a news cycle is happening. I mean, you just have to ask yourself, when Reddit and 4chan were trying to use racial profiling and then targeting Sonia Tripathi as the potential killer, if that conversation would have changed at all, if there had been a few journalists who were already respected members of the Reddit community standing up, raising their hands and saying it was wrong. Thank you very much.